Please, go ahead. Nice to meet you all. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my sincere uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for having invited me. Uh, this is my exactly second experience in participating in uh, such kind of uh, digital humanities conference. So, uh, you see my title on the screen, yes. uh, and uh, in fact, I know that uh, you recently uh, had a workshop uh, which dealt with uh, stylometry, and you are all profi specialists in this subject, and I expect to have a feedback. <laughs> So, uh, from time to time, we encounter a medieval book described in uh, modern catalogs and academic publications to such and such an author. This formulation implies that authenticity of the book attributed to the author is uncertain. Sometimes, <coughs> to emphasize that fact, the title pseudo is added to the author's name. On the other hand, uh, some medieval authors plainly mention the cases of intended counterfeiting, false attribution, and even plagiarism during the Islamic mid Middle Ages. The problem of uh, authenticity especially concerns medieval poetry and the texts written in the genre of mirrors for princes. That's why a reliable stylometry, or perhaps better to say in this context, digital diagnostics of texts, is in very high demand these days to separate genuine works from spurious ones in Persian and Arabic literature. As you know, any fake necessarily follows a recognizable and well-known pattern, which sometimes makes it hard to distinguish the fake from a genuine work without additional instruments. Let's say banknotes, paintings, jewelries, for example. The same concerns medieval texts fabricated with selfish, ideological and other reasons. To disclose these reasons is the ultimate result of textual studies because any forgery or fake is an artifact. Artifacts and its history should be treated as history of genuine works. So, first of all, we have to know the standard patterns and forms of writing the majority of Arabic and Persian books. Then, to compare a suspicious text with these forms. And finally, to convincingly show a, pur a purpose the forgery was made for. Due to the lack of time, I shall confine myself here to making a few general observations on the patterns and forms widespread in non-fictional prose literature, leaving aside the cases of false attribution in Persian and Arabic poetry, which begin, for example, with the uh, 115th surah added to Quran, many inauthentic portrayals attributed to the famous Umar Khayyam. The seventh book uh, of the Masnavi ascribed to renowned Sufi poet Jalaluddin Rumi, and so on. Almost every medieval Persian poet has a considerable number of verses falsely attributed to him. There were three main forms of writing the non-fictional and scholarly books during the Islamic medieval ages. Jam, collection, talif, compilation, and tasnif, classification or composition. They cover all genres of Islamic scholarly literature, hagiographical, historic, theological, etc. Cases. Uh, the first two terms, uh, jam collection and talif compilation, occur together 
uh, either in the forward or compilation implies collection as a self-evident and preliminary stage of the author's work. Classification normally stands apart, representing a quite different and independent form of the writing. The same concerns the authors. They are named Jami, collector, Malif, compiler, and Musanid, classifier. The key difference between these forms is in relation of synthesis and analysis. Compiling a book in the form of primary or secondary compilation, its author must choose between the oral or written sources correspondingly. Some slight combination of them seems to be possible, however. The form of primary compilation implies that a medieval compiler had to collect material from the oral sources, that's either from the living informants or his own memory. Then he had to make a selection of uh, what is to be included and or excluded, and finally to arrange the collected material following a pattern already given to him by the existing tradition. Thus, he received the right to entitle his own compilation and to write a forward to it. The, uh, this pattern used by him didn't imply any uh, analysis, but only synthesis. The primary compilation was mostly applied in Islamic medieval literature to the hagiographical genre, with its pattern obviously descending from uh, literature related to the Prophet Muhammad's life and sayings, as well as to the early compilations of prophetic traditions. Um, in the case of the second drop compilation, a compiler had to follow the same logics and method as in the case of primary compilations, with the only difference. He had to collect material from the written sources, and again, while presenting it, he had to follow the order and style, which had already been proposed as a genre pattern, pattern uh, by the literary and scholarly traditions of his days. The secondary compilation was the most widespread form in Islamic written tradition, which can be frequently seen in all of its genres. This logical approach to writing compilations is quite comparable to that of widespread in our days. Applying to the modern style of uh, academic publishing, both, uh, both forms of medieval compilations uh, are similar to a considerable number of citations taken either, either from oral or written sources and arranged according to a certain pattern. We can find many medieval books without a single word said by the author himself, except his foreword, sometimes formal or in some cases even without foreword. Originality of these compilations is presented by the author's selection of sources. In many cases, this selection is intended to plainly show the religious school he is affiliated with. Uh, for centuries, uh, both uh, these forms of uh, compilation were applied to different genres in medieval Islamic literature, implying preservation of the scholarly approaches to writing, as well as to methods of argumentation. Thus, uh, from stylometric point of view, we have a considerable number of styles collected in one book, because the author of primary compilation was required to have a considerable number of the living informants and narrators with their personal styles representing the oral tradition. While the author of the secondary compilation was expected either to have at his disposal 
or to study in traditional way a considerable number of the books written by his foreigners with their personal styles in order to select illustrative quotations for his own compilation. The form of classification. Yeah. The sniff seems to be the most interesting form of writing. In this case, the author has to offer, uh, in fact, a new insight into the current literary and academic tradition in order to advance his ideas. He has to change or even to challenge, to challenge it by combination of synthesis and analysis. Such innovations would, would be reflected in his book either in its form or content, or even both. To accomplish this goal, he must have the right at skill, which are closely related to his religious and social status, especially when his writing touches upon confessional and theological issues. Thus, we would see a certain number of citations with their own fingerprints accompanied by the author's original statements and conclusions with his personal fingerprint. Therefore, each tasnif appears to provide sufficient reason to consider it as a literary and academic alternative to the first two forms of compilation. It's aimed to offer a new approach to the existing scholarly traditions either expressed by the author declaratively or introduced by him practically. In the latter case, we can expect to see substantial changes in the form, structure, and content of his writing in comparison with the previous and widespread scholarly patterns used by his forerunners in the same field of studies. As a consequence, these changes lead us to a new original pattern offered by this author. Okay. Um, as already mentioned, <coughs> the author of any fabrication and fate, money, paintings, jewelry, tries to simulate a genuine work as close as possible in order to reach his purpose at minimum costs. The same concerns the fabricated medieval texts. There are three main types of Islamic of the Islamic medieval forgers as defined by traditional textual studies. Below, I will compare them with the results of stylometry recently presented by Dr. Eder in his Rolling Stylometry. This is article. The first type of forgeries fabrications deals with a simple compilation when an uh, authentic text, the text is supplemented at the end with uh, in uh, inauthentic one, and the whole compilation is intentionally ascribed to an author of the first text without any attempts of stylization, using cookery definitions. It looks like a double layer file, like this. As you can see, this way of fabrication goes side by side with quite traditional and legal manner of writing the secondary compilations. For example, some medieval historical works uh, were uh, chronologically, chronologically updated by the second author from the point at which his predecessor stopped. Moreover, there are some texts compiled unintentionally in this way, and then falsely attributed to the first author. This happened due to scribal errors when scribes skip titles and colophons joining the second text to the first one. A fabrication made in this way is the simplest one for digital diagnostics, since we would have just two fingerprints. The same example is given by uh, Dr. Eder in the case of the 13th century French poem entitled Roman de la Rose. The poem was collaboratively written by two authors. 
let us imagine that the author of the second part of the poem, namely uh, Jean de Mont, remain unknown, unknown to us, and the whole poem is ascribed to the author of the first part. That's to Guillaume de Loris. De Loris. <laughs> At the same time, the results of digital textual diagnostics or stylometry should uh, show two different styles here on the slide this is exactly what the first type of medieval fabrications and false attributions demonstrates therefore applied to this style stylometry is expected to be very effective if there would be a reference corpus of authentic texts taken as uh, ethylon and written by one author. In each particular case, only one question would remain open, whether the second part was intentionally attached by a medieval forger or coincidentally added by a medieval scribe. For example, such is the case of the second part of the Nasihat al-Muluk, Council for Kings, Kings, compiled without any attempts of stylization, this part has wrongly been ascribed for centuries to the outstanding Muslim thinker, Muhammad al-Ghazali, uh, the end of uh, 10th century, the beginning of the 12th century AD, who is the author of the first authentic part. The second type of fabrication is a compilation in which uh, segments or fragments of the authentic texts written by a famous author are intentionally combined and mixed with those of inauthentic in order to create an, the illusion of authenticity and to achieve its goals by appealing to authority of the author. Following cookery definitions, the whole compilation looked like a multi-layer This type of fabrication seems to be the most complicated for digital diagnostics because it's very similar both to the form of secondary compilation provided with simple synthesis and the form of classification accompanied by combination of synthesis and analysis. Even with multiple styles detected, we cannot be sure that the whole text is inauthentic. The same compilation will, will be considered legal and authentic if it has a unique title, a definite author, and a foreword written by him. On the other hand, the unique title can be attributed by a forger to these texts. The text is itself can be ascribed by him to the definite author, and the foreword to the text can be written by him instead of the author. That's why some medieval fakes and fabrications made in this way have survived to the present day unrevealed. This type of fabrication with, uh, with multiple fingerprints is similar to the case of the Queen Sophia's Bible described by Edward in his rolling telemetry. The book is defined by him as a collaborative work in which the transla translatorial, authorial, and scribal signals are heavily mixed. In spite of the fact that there were five translators with their stylistic breaks uh, detected by stylometry, the book is not considered by specialists as a fabrication. The main problem in revealing such fabrications in medieval Islamic literature is that the number of the most frequently words in each stylistic segment is often less than 500 or even 100. In this case, stylometry seems to be less effective or even can show wrong results in searching for the authorial signal or fingerprint. This type of fabrication especially concerns <coughs> the texts written in epistolar and documentary genres since there was 
a definite style in writing official letters and documents, which could be repeated with no need to provide them with original forwards, titles, and permission for copying. On the other hand, the author's style used by him in informal letters could be changed in each particular case, depending on the author's relationship with his addressee. To reveal fabrications made in this way, we need to have a vast reference corpus of authentic texts undoubt undoubtedly written by the author in the same style, and or to have at our disposals, disposal all the sources used by a forger which is practically impossible. For example, there is a fabrication, a fabrication entitled A Farzan or Child and made in Persian one, two generations after the death of the above mentioned Muhammad al Ghazali. Uh, the fabrication was compiled from his two general letters, from a letter written by his brother. Ahmed al-Ghazali to his disciple, and as well as from the disciple's own letter. Later, this fabrication was translated into Arabic as uh, the Ayuhal wallet, became very popular and has been published for centuries under the authorship of Muhammad al-Ghazali. However, even traditional textual analysis shows that over 25% of the sayings cited in this fabrication, both in its Persian original and Arabic translation, were falsely attributed to different persons and belong there to a category of the forged sayings, al-Hadith al mawdu al While the fragments related to the two general letters by Muhammad al-Ghazali, along the sayings cited there exactly correspond to what he said in his voluminous book, Ihyaulum ad din taken as an authentic reference text. The third type of fabrication is a so-called intellectual forgery. When an uh, authentic text is edited by a forger in a way that the final text look like a pie with inauthentic feeling like this. It's sufficient for him to add or delete the negative particle in a sentence in order to change its meaning um, to the opposite one, not to mention the more complex intellectual editing. To prepare a critical edition based on several manuscripts and provided with variant readings would reveal such forgery as well as correct occasional scribal errors. Well, uh, some reasons uh, can be methodological pitfalls in applying digital diagnostics to medieval fabrications. Taken together, they can mask or substantially corrupt a fingerprint even in a short citation. The first typical pitfall Scribe errors and uh, unauthorized editing. The second one, classical system of Islamic education. When a student had to scrutinize a considerable number of different books by making notes on copying and even memorizing them. Thus, the content of these books left in his memory it seems to have been unnecessary for him even to have in hand the hard copies of the books while writing his own scholarly compilation. He just had to use his own memory with, with its malfunctions, which negatively influenced the original style and accuracy of the citations memorized by him. The third typical pitfall Translation of a forgery or fabrication into foreign languages, which belong to different language groups and families, especially double translation. Uh, for example, from Persian into Arabic and then from Arabic into Persian, the same text. 
Having such translation for digital diagno uh, diagnostics, there is no chance to reveal the forger. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> It's a good thing, Alexei, that this is right before the break. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> okay, questions or comments for Alexei? Yes, please. Uh, yes, maybe it's uh, very interesting. And as number two, uh, you presented Arbor for East uh, Western European languages. Um, what are the differences in the language? Didn't get you. Once again, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the example of spider are from uh, applications to Western European languages, like French, and uh, also Eastern European languages. Well, uh, so uh, what are the specific um, uh, products uh, You see, uh, the logic logics is the same. Uh, so, uh, the machine logic is also the same. Uh, they calculate uh, figures, not words. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, there are many uh, examples in uh, European literature, in Russian literature, of fabrications, intentionally made fabrications, with selfish, ideological, or whatever reasons. So, uh, uh, to compile this kind of fabrications, we need to, to uh, simulate this, uh, simulate the region. <laughs> so the logic is the same. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Um, just to follow up on that, it's it's the typical the typical way to do stylometry is to count the the most frequent words. It's yeah. the 100 most frequent words or 200 most frequent words. And those tend to be prepositions and conjunctions and things like that. And the fact that it's, it, it's an interesting question because the fact that in, if I understand correctly, as Semitic language, Arabic often has prepositions and conjunctions prefixed to other words as opposed to being freestanding words. And so if you, if you look at Arabic in that way, is this is this still going to work just because it's a it's it has these these prefixes? Well, uh, I know Machen has done this with with Latin. He's done it with Polish. He's done it with other Eastern European languages, and so it's not just Western, but it's typically European languages. So, I mean, I, yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, that, that shouldn't be a problem. You coach should know which way which way the. I don't see any problem. And even if you move from left to right, it actually, I'm not sure that it would be that big a deal. Right instead of right to left. I think it would still. The main the problem way. is the most frequently words. Yeah. This is the main problem. Yeah. Not uh, the script or language. Yeah. Uh, because uh, uh, minimum, we should have uh, 5,000 words. Uh, sometimes we have. Uh, uh, compilation that uh, uh, maybe 10,000 words, that's all. And uh, this compilation is fabricated intentionally. Some passages uh, are genuine, some not. So. Yeah. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, no. no. <laughs> Come closer. We'll see so you first. For the, for the smaller personnel, and we want to this, which has just like over 70,000 words. Uh -huh. So we are not sure if some of the points we don't agree or not, and also some verses if we need a point. Does it also work for these smaller personnel, or it's not enough? So is there any way that we uh, can also? The title of my article The Expected. Expected. <laughs> so we have to check to test the upper weight. Yes, some small chances. Yeah, I know this problem, not only with Hafiz. There's a big problem in Persian poetry. <laughs> 
Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Great. I'll go ahead and 